Good morning, Central family and friends. Our next Connect class will be next Sunday, August the 8th, following the 11 a.m. worship time. If you're new to Central, or if you have recently joined, this class is for you. Over the course of about an hour, you will learn about the Central family and get to meet some of our pastors. A meal will be provided, so you need to RSVP. You can do so by calling the church office or by texting CONNECT to 501-329-9283. Senior adults, there will be a luncheon this Thursday, August the 5th at 11 a.m. Our guest speaker will be Stan Young and our meal will be provided by Adam's Catfish and the cost will be $10 per person. You can sign up for this time of fellowship at both Welcome Centers today. Youth Central will be having a luau this Friday, August the 6th from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Centennial Valley Country Club. This will be a great time of fun and fellowship and a great opportunity to invite friends. For more information, see Brother Aaron Russell. If you're new to Central, we want to encourage you to fill out a Connect card that's located in the seat back in front of you. Then you can drop it off in a connection box that's located throughout the building. Now join us as we praise our great God today at Central. Good morning, Central family. We're excited to start off the service with Believer's Baptism. This is Easton Temple, and Easton trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior on his front porch, and I'm thankful that he'll always remember that. If you are a family member or a friend, or if you have taught him in life group class or vacation Bible school, we'd like for you to stand up and be a part of this celebration. And Easton, we are so proud of you. And we pray that God's going to use you in a mighty way for his glory. So on your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is my honor to baptize you, my little brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Let's stand together this morning, church, as we sing together. Hey, hymn of praise at Calvary. I want to welcome you. Welcome our guests. Welcome our online viewers this morning to worship. Let's sing it out, church. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Calvary this morning, well, when we come in his name, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son.
praise the Lord. Amen. Our God saves. Amen. You may be seated. A verse that comes to mind when I think about our God's salvation, it says, there is no other name given among man whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. And that wonderful passage that Peter, Peter preached in Acts chapter 4. We're glad you're here. We pray that the name of Jesus will be more near and dear to you. We've already seen one baptism this morning. We celebrate with that family and that candidate that came. And Easton was baptized for Brother David. And Brother David had another one from camp that came forward and professed Christ as Savior this morning in the 830 service. So we're thankful for that as well. And he'll be scheduling that baptism in the near future. And we hope if you're out there and you hadn't been baptized and you're not really certain about your own salvation, you'll uh, do due diligence in counseling, talk to one of the pastors, and we'd love to have the opportunity to lead you through that process as well. Speaking of which, next Lord's Day, we will be hosting another Connect class here at Central. And if you've not registered yet and you've been visiting our church, you want more information about our church, that's a wonderful opportunity for you to come and get connected here at Central. So you can call the church office, one of the little Connect cards in front of you in the pew. You can give us your information and just on the back of that card write, I would like to attend Connect class. And we'll get you more information even this week. But we're glad you're here. Brother Ben South is going to come and preach in just a few minutes. So be praying for him and let's continue to praise our Lord. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to be here in this place today with these people. We thank you for all of our guests and all of our central family that you've gathered here this morning. Lord, I thank you for the choir and orchestra and praise team as, we, uh, as they have led us to thus far in praise and worship of your glorious name. Lord, may we lift your name high. May we exalt you. Lord, you tell us if we would lift you up that all men would be drawn to you. And Lord, I pray today that that would just come a re become a reality even in this service that we would be drawn afresh and anew to you just in our awareness of your presence and your ministry in and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Do your worship this morning as you celebrate God's goodness.
goodness. Amen. praise this morning. Father, our hope this morning is that your light, your grace, your love will pour over us and that we might be a reflection of you to a world and to a people who desperately need to see you. That is our aim and that is our hope today. Would you accomplish that in our midst today? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It is good to see you here in the Lord's house this morning. Glad you're here. For those of you joining us online, we, we thank you for joining in with us as well today. We're going to be talking this morning about our gospel-powered work. The work we have to do. How do we do it? What's the strength for it? If we were honest, 
we would prefer probably the moment we were saved, if God would just take us on to heaven, right? We wouldn't have to deal with the heartaches of this life, the troubles of this world, the, the temptations that we face, any of the struggles. If God would save us and take us on to glory, things would be much easier for all of us, yes? But the truth is, for the vast majority of us, that's not the case. But God saves us, he redeems us, he forgives us, and then he keeps us here. And he doesn't just leave us here for nothing, but there's a purpose in it. And God has a designated and designed and ordained work for us to do. We're going to be looking at a passage in, the God, in the, uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 12 in just a few moments. But it starts this way, and it says, therefore. And so because every time we come to that word, therefore, you know, you have to look back and see what it's there for. We need to start back the few verses ahead. Just remind ourselves what he is talking about. In this passage just previous, Paul has given us a beautiful picture of Christ. Of who Christ is, of what he had done, that he did not think equality with God. His place in heaven was something to be grasped or held onto, but he took on the form of a servant, came to earth, lived in the likeness of men. He humbled himself, he was obedient, he even went to the cross for us. He was faithful in the task he had. The work God had given him to do on this earth, he was obedient to it and did it. And so we come to verse 12, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, and he says, Therefore, because of that, because of the example you have, because of what Christ has done, because of the life he lived, here's what you need to do. Therefore, my beloved, in verse 12, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So there's the example. We see Jesus. And Paul says, because of what Jesus did... Here's what you need to do. We're going to see three things today. There's a work, and there's a witness, and there's a waiting for all of us. The work. It's what we're to do. He says in this passage, work out your own salvation. Now, we must be clear here first. Paul is not saying that we work in order to get our salvation. Scripture is very clear. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. It's not of works that we've done. No work of righteousness could we ever do to earn or deserve our own salvation. It is wholly a work of Christ. But once we come to know him as Savior, there is work for us to do. We work because of the salvation he has given us. So there's a work for us to do. Well, what is that work? Well, it has to do with our conduct. He says, look, you have been obedient. You have always obeyed. Verse 12, our conduct, the way we live our life is our work. It's what we do to faithfully obey Christ in how we live. We follow Christ's example. We walk in humility. We don't think of ourselves too highly. We consider others more than we consider ourselves. Why? Because of Christ's example. So that's our work. It's our conduct. And it also continues. 
There's to be perseverance in the way you work. What does he say? Not only now, but much more my absence. Keep doing this. Keep living obediently. Our work as believers, as we work out our salvation, is to obey Christ and to keep obeying him. And the problem is in our microwave culture, we like to have things happen quickly. But the truth is obedience to Christ and faithfulness to him and discipleship to him, there are no shortcuts. Eugene Peterson wrote a book and he used this title. He said, it's a long obedience in the same direction. It's a great book talking about the Christian life and discipleship. But that's just what our calling is, this work. In persevering, it's a long obedience. It means it's not something we just do at the end or for a little while, but it's a continual ongoing obedience to Christ, heading toward him. You know, the Olympics are on, I'm sure most of you are aware, and we watch that and you see, and all you see are these teams winning in the races and the swimmers, will, will, you see that race where they touch the wall first and you think that looks so easy, they've made it look so simple to do all those things, to swim that fast or to run that fast, whatever event you're watching. See, that's just a part of it. They didn't get there celebrating there after a few days of work. What you don't see are the long hours, the early mornings, swimming for miles, running with weights, the long days of work and hard, the years, the multiple years they have put into that moment to see eventually victory. It's a long, arduous task. You see, much like those athletes who compete in the Olympics, we are in a long race. There is much work for us to do in our life as we work out our salvation. It's to be continual. And he says here you need to do this with a certain awareness. Because he says, work out your salvation. Do this with fear and trembling. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean we're to walk around scared all the time and and just too afraid to do anything for God? No. But what he's saying is, you need to know who it is you're really serving. Because when you are striving to live for God, the true God... It should cause you to shudder a little bit because of who he is. We work for the God who created and controls the entire universe. It should cause us to to be just careful in the way we live. We should have that fear, that awe, that respect of who God is, that it causes us to obey. Proverbs tells us that fear of the Lord, that respect, that that just awareness of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's what helps us know what to do. And so in this work, we obey. We seek to do what Christ wants us to do. We continue it. And, And here's one more thing. If you're not careful, you'll miss it in English. Because when it says work out your own salvation. That your is not you individually. That is a plural pronoun. And it means work out you, you all, y'all, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, there are individual aspects that I must do. However, God intends for you and for me to work out our salvation, to do this work, to do this obedience. He intends for us to do that in community. You see, the Christian life is not one that can ever be lived in isolation. It can't be lived alone. You can't live an obedient life to Christ by yourself. You can't just watch it and and hope to get along. You must participate and live in community with others. And Paul is saying this, you as a group together, when you are serving and working out this together, you do this. There is a community aspect of working out our salvation as we encourage one another and spur one one another on to love toward good works. You, yes, you individually must do that, but you need 
to do it in the context of the family of God with other believers. So there's a work we need to do, but there's a work that is done. It's a work that is done in us because you would stop and think, well, this is scary. I'm, uh, this fear and this uh, uh, trembling that's caused here by the God of the universe who I need to obey, I'm not sure I can do that on my own. This work is daunting, and the truth is that's correct. You can't do it on your own. But because of the work we are to do, there is a work that is done in us. Let's see here what it says. At first we see God's person. It is God who works in you. It is the God, the real and personal God, the one who loves you. He's the one who's doing a work. So his person helps us know we can be obedient. His power, he's the one who works. The God who works. Paul elsewhere, he talks about this, how we know we don't do anything ourselves. We're not sufficient in ourselves, he says in 2 Corinthians. We don't claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. And in Colossians, he says, I toil and I struggle with all this energy that he powerfully works within me. You see, we are able to work out because God works within us in his power. The God who calls us to obedience, the God who calls us to holiness, the God who calls you and me to this work empowers us with his ability to do the work to which he calls us. And he promises to be with us because he says, he does this work in you. He does it in us personally. He saves us. And when we know him as Savior, he dwells within us to work inside of us. And he does it corporately as we gather as a church with other believers. He works in us together. God, his presence is in here and working through us. Why? For his purpose. What does he say? He says he works in you both to will and to work. Well, what is that will? It's what you want. It's your desires. You might call this your holy discontent at times when you are not satisfied with the way you're living your life, when sin comes in, with your failures. He gives you a holy desire to do holy things. So he, he wants us to, to live for them. Well, we're not satisfied. And there's this aching inside of us that tells us we need to do more for him. He also gives us aspirations where we begin to hate that sin and desire to live that holy life. He comes in with that will and changes our want to. He changes what we want to do. Why? So we can do the work. Why? Because you are his workmanship. You were created in Christ. Why? For good works. Christ didn't save you just to someday take you to heaven. Christ saved you, has created you for the work he has called you to do. And he's prepared that work for you to do. And he wants you to do it and that you should walk in that. So God's purpose is that he changes your desires to do what he wants you to do, to be obedient. And finally... We see God's pleasure is how we do it. What does he say? He works in you to change your will, to cause you to work for his good pleasure so that you can glorify Jesus. That song we sang earlier, we sing, for the glory of Jesus' name. That's why we serve. That's what we strive for is to, to worship him and to glorify him. See, when you work for God, when you are obedient, when you live that holy life, it pleases God. So because it pleases him, he gives us the means, the ability to do it. So there's a work well, this work isn't just so we have something to do, but this work serves as a witness to the world as well. Verse 14, he says, do all things. And, and the problem is there, that word all. Because it's easy for us to do some things in the way he's going to describe. But that all causes us all problems from time to time. And you'll see why in just a second. But he says, look, you're my witness. You're going to be a witness to the world so 
everything you do needs to fall in here. Remember the example of Christ. Here's how you need to do it. Because you're a witness. You need to first do things with gratitude. We say, I don't see gratitude. No, but he says without grumbling. And I don't, we've all had that problem. Now, the, the original word here is gongusmos, which I love that word because it's one of those, it sounds like what you're doing, gongusmos. And you just, you know what it's like when people grumble, gongusmos. It's just that word. <laughs> you've heard it. You've probably done it. Well, I don't like that. We don't want it that way. That's not the way we've always done things. I don't like things that way. We've been doing this since the beginning of time. What did Adam say? Well, God, that woman you gave me. <laughs> the children of Israel was it? Well, God, you just brought us out here in the desert. All you've given us is this man to eat, grumbling. We constantly are grumbling. We live in a culture that says, I deserve more. I deserve better. I'm never satisfied with anything. Nothing is ever good enough. We are a people most blessed. We are, the fact that you live here in the United States means you are some of the richest people in the world. No matter what your income level is here, you are some of the richest in the world. But we are entitled and think we deserve more. We grumble. And our discontent leads to complaining. And we grumble. Grumble, grumble, grumble. I don't like that. But Paul says, do all things. That means even coming to church. Because it may be that we don't sing the song you like, or somebody doesn't say something the way you think they should, or somebody didn't speak to you in the hallway. Grumble, grumble, grumble. It's not the way I want it. Paul says, do all things. Why? Because you are a witness to the world. Do it without grumbling. So we're to do it with gratitude. Then he says, do it with unity. Why? Do it without grumbling or disputing. What does it mean to dispute? It means, God, are you sure you knew what you were doing here? If you're watching the Olympics, some of them, some of the sports, they allow the, the coaches or the teams to dispute a call. And they'll, you know, throw a flag or throw something in and say, I don't think that was the right, I don't think you made the right decision. And they'll say to the referee, you didn't get that right. You didn't see all the circumstances. They dispute the call. Don't we do that all the time in life? God, are you sure you knew what you were doing? God, this circumstance, are you sure you know? I don't think you knew everything that I'm dealing with, God. We deal with that in the church. Do you know all the things that I'm having to deal with? Why I want it this way? We dispute with one another. And when we get into an attitude of disputing, you know what we're saying? I don't trust the sovereign hand of God. Did you hear me? When we begin to be disputers, we're doubting God. And we say, God, I don't think you understand this situation. And you need to reconsider. But Paul tells us, because we're witnesses in the world, we do all things with gratitude, in unity. We have the mind of Christ trusting him. He also says we need to do it without blemish or with purity. He wants us to walk unstained from the world. Why? Because we live in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, it says. Now those words are just simply what they say. They're twisted. They're crooked. They're not going straight. They're not striving. It's anything that departs from truth. The world is, is going all over the place. But you are not to be like that. You're to walk in purity. The way you think, what you do, where you go. The problem is so many times in our lives as believers, we try to see how much we can do and get away with and still be okay with God. And instead of trying to have just enough sin as we can get away with, we need to be striving for purity in every area. Do we ever get to it perfectly? No, we don't. But our goal must be purity because we are a witness to the world. We need to stand out from the world to be different. We don't need to be crooked and twisted like them. Why? Because it says next, we shine as lights. So as we shine, we need to do it with gratitude, with unity, with purity, and with grace. 
We shine as lights. The lights come on in the room and they get rid of the darkness. And there's a difference. The problem is too many times in our lives, we don't look any different from the world. And you can't shine as a light in darkness if you are dark. Therefore, we must be different. We must strive after and obey Christ and do what he has called us to do, to live this life. We're that gospel witness to the world. We must appear different. You see, the thing is, when we appear different, when we act different, when we do things differently, the world is not going to understand why. They're not going to see why we do it or how we're doing it. Why? Because the world loves darkness rather than light. And so when we live as light, when we shine, it's, it sounds this wonderful, yes, we're shining, but the world is not going to like that. But God calls us still to be light here. Shining is light. Walking with grace in every situation. And then he says, finally, we do that with commitment. Our witness is one of commitment. He says, you hold fast to the word of life. Now we think, initially you would think this is just a holding on to the word of God. I'm going to trust the word of God. But that's not what he's saying here. In this passage, what he is proclaiming is, you hold fast. You believe. You push forward the gospel. The truth of the gospel. The truth that Christ changes life. Hold fast to the word of life. In a world that's dying, that's crooked, and that's twisted, you hold on to what's true and what's right and what's pure and what's good. You hold on to those things and push those out. Proclaim the gospel with your life and what you do. You shine by holding out and proclaiming this truth that Christ saves. Share with them The work that brings life. So there's a work for us to do, and it's a witness to the world, but there's still a waiting we have to do. Paul says, he says, so that in the day of Christ, he's saying, look, I know right now this is hard. I'm in a jail cell. I don't know that Paul thought he was getting ready to be executed at that point or what. He said, look, I know right now living this way is going to be hard. And no one's going to understand it. And you're going to think you can't do it. But in that day of Christ, what is the day of Christ? That's when we as believers, those who put trust in Christ and have saved and know him, we will be with him. And in that day, all the things we don't understand, we will understand. All the circumstances that we couldn't contemplate while we had to go through them will make sense. And Paul says, in the day of Christ, but until then we wait. And so we right now are in a time of waiting. And one day we will look back, but until then, no, as Paul says here, there's going to be sacrifice. He says he's being poured out as a drink offering, which means we are going to have to give of ourselves at time. Why? For the work of the gospel. He says, I'm going to look back and I'm going to know it's not in vain because you're going to be there with me in the presence of Christ and I'll know what I've done is worthwhile because of Christ. But there's going to be sacrifice in the waiting. The sacrifice here is worship to God. And in our circumstances, there are going to be places and times we have to just wait. And we may not think we can make it through. And we may have to give up some things, but it will be worth it all. There's sacrifice and there's service. In other translations in this verse, he talks about the the sacrificial offering of your faith in verse 17. And there are also some translations that include the phrase, your service of faith. You see, your work in the waiting time is service to God. And his worship to him. And this service of faith, of believing, is the exact opposite of complaining and disputing. So when we are complaining and disputing, we're not worshiping God in that. But we serve. And in that is worship to God. And then finally, he says, 
There's a sharing in this waiting time. He says, I'm glad and rejoice with you all because I see what God is doing through this. And he says, likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. When we, you, all of us, work out our salvation together with fear and trembling of a holy and righteous God, we do it with gratitude, with unity, with purity, with grace, with a commitment. There's joy. It doesn't mean the circumstances change. It doesn't mean the heartache is gone. But there is joy in that. There is rejoicing in it. How? Because that action, that obedience is rooted and founded upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are waiting for that day when that hope that we have that's found in the gospel will become true. And you say, I've heard the gospel message. I've heard all that. We talk about the gospel this, gospel that. You're always saying the gospel. I'm tired of hearing about the gospel. My friend, let me tell you this. If you're tired of hearing about the gospel, you really need to hear the gospel. That's the fix for it. Because that is everything. Everything. For you and for me. That's how we get through life. It's the gospel message, the truth that Jesus came, that he gave himself for us. And he offers us salvation if we will but believe in him. That is the only hope we have. And in the midst of our suffering, while we're serving, when we're doing what God has called us to do, we're faithfully obeying, there is joy because of the hope and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the work, it's going to be hard. Work is hard. Work is good for you. You can't do it on your own. But you need the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ driving you every day. That's what will sustain you and keep you going. So as we close, a couple of questions for you. Will you work? Will you be obedient? We even try to be obedient to what Christ says to do. For some of us, you may not know Christ as Savior. Today would be a great day to you experience this joy. You can come to him wherever you are and put your faith in Christ. And he will save you. And you too can walk in obedience. For many of us, though, maybe we need to ask about our witness. What does it look like to the world? Are we grumblers? Or are we walking in gratitude, seeking unity with grace to others? What does our witness look like? Are we shining in a dark world? Or do we look like the world? What's our witness look like? And in this waiting, in this time until we come face to face with Christ, until then, there are going to be sacrifices. There's going to be opportunity for service. But until then, we can have joy. We can rejoice in the toils and the labors of this world because they are worth it because of Jesus Christ. That is how we work for him in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the work it's done in my heart. God, forgive me when I've grumbled and complained, not lived in grace, and I've wanted to give up because it's hard. Help me to lean on you and the truth of your gospel to be obedient and faithful in every area. And may we as a people... Lean heavily 
and lean fully on you, not on us. As we work out our salvation, may we lean into the gospel. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Central. We as a church are committed to connecting people to Jesus. You can help us do this by giving to conwaycentralchurch.org slash give. We would love for you to join us here at 3333 Dave Ward Drive. If you need a pastor, please call us. The pastor on call number is 501-450-7472. Thanks again for joining us today at Central. Central.